During a commercial inspection following the COMSOP standards for the heating and ventilating section, it is important for the inspector to describe the installed heating units, components, heating source, and operating systems of all of those units, including noting any units that are not operational. We do not operate any systems that are off at the time of the inspection, and we should do that through normal means of operation. Every building is going to be a little different, and in this building that we're inspecting today, we will be inspecting packaged rooftop units, mini split units, as well as electric baseboard units. With that, let's get started on our heating inspection. While inspecting the gas meter and gas supply system in a building, it's important to start at the meter. Per the COMSOP standards, we are to note if there's multiple meters or singular meters, and if there are multiple meters, we should make sure that they're labeled. In this particular building, it's a single occupant or a single tenant or a single use building, and there's only one gas meter. There's not a tremendous amount of gas use in this building, so they're using a fairly standard small gas meter. As parts of the gas meter, we have the main meter apparatus, we have a pressure regulator, and we have a main shutoff valve. The main shutoff valve is a lockable valve for either the utility or the building owner to lock it out if it's, when it is shut off. The regulator is designed to maintain the gas pressure. If there's an influx or too much pressure that comes into the system, it has a diaphragm on the inside of this and it will expel gas out. Periodic smelling of gas is not unusual, but if it's a constant or continual amount of gas that you smell, then it's probably something you want to report to the meter, uh, to the, to the utility service for, for maintenance. And then the gas pipe migrates up the building. The gas pipe is coated. It, this particular gas pipe, because it's on the, uh, on, on the uh, pedestrian or, or the outside of the building, they, they have this coated in, in a dark color, complementary to the building. Um, the, the whole idea is the gas pipe should always be coated and not left as the black iron to rust. But it is important for you to note, if the gas meter is buried, it should be up, it should be out of the soil. And like I said, if we do have multiple meters, they should be labeled so you clearly, so you know which, which meter goes to which occupant. But in this case, with only one meter, we don't need a label because we know it's only for this building. And as a note, if the gas meter or the system is shut off, you're not required to open it up. You never turn on valves, always, always inspect the system as it sits. So again, if the gas meter is shut off, leave it off. As we continue with our gas pipe inspection, we're up on the roof. A uh, gas pipe is often on a commercial building distributed through roof piping. Uh, the piping is typically found to be rusty and old and, and poorly coated. In this particular case, this is perfect. The pipe is supposed to be coated. It, it, should be, it should be free of defects. It should be securely fastened and up off the deck. We should never have gas pipe found on the deck of the roof. It causes abrasion to not only the roof deck, but then if the pipe is laying there on the roof deck, it will rust. And so in this particular case, again, this pipe is wonderfully coated and it's up off the deck. The particular blocks that we have are called chairs. They can use four by fours like this on some form of pad to keep the roof from abrasing, or they could be on an official plastic or, uh, or other material but we typically find them to be on a treated four by four, and you'll see that we're well secured every four foot throughout the entire system. And in coating the gas pipe, as we see here, all gas pipe should be coated yellow. And, that, and so it is, uh, it is coated in yellow through this whole system. If it's left in its black state, and it's next to other piping, it should be clearly labeled with a sticker that says gas pipe. So two things to watch for, look for the sticker that says gas pipe on black pipe, or if it's, if it's been painted yellow, it does not require the sticker because yellow is, a, is, the, is the color for gas and gas only. And so that's really important for us to identify. And then lastly, uh, we want to make sure we look for drip legs as we approach every appliance. Let's go look at the drip leg that we have on our next appliance. Heating and ventilating is part of the standards of practice for the COMSOP. When looking at the heating and ventilating, it's important first to identify how you, get, how you get to the appliance. You are not required 
to get on any appliance that's 16 foot off the ground that does not have a permanently installed access point. That's really important to note that. So again, you should note any time that a, an appliance is placed above 16 foot that you do not have a permanent access. So that means you don't have to carry a 20, 30, 40 foot ladder to get up on that roof. In this particular roof, we have access, so we, we, we have access to get up here. Also, if an appliance is placed on a roof deck that has a slope greater than 25 foot, there needs to be a working platform in front of that appliance so that you don't have to stand on an inclined plane. You can work safely and on a level surface. Another part of the comp stop, we need to never turn on an appliance that is in a shutoff position. If it is in a shutoff position, you are to note what, where it's shut off and, and not inspect that other than visually. There's also a part of the standard that talks about having a convenience outlet within 25 foot of the appliance or in a general proximity. In this particular unit, I don't have an outlet. That would be something that I would want to discuss uh, and place on my report. Also, as part of the standard, we are supposed to note if there's any venting coming out within 10 foot of the appliance, so that way we don't have any contamination. We are, we are also to report on, on a slope of piping and flue piping, but we do not have to take any testing or any diagnosis of, of proper operation. With that, make sure you understand the entire ComSOP before you start doing any heating and ventilating inspections. Continuing with our gas pipe inspection, we know through the, through the, through the typical gas pipe distribution standard, anytime we, we, trans, we move in an angle, we need to have the downward leg be a drip leg. And so we come in here, I have a T here, this drip leg catches condensation and sediment before it comes up and goes into the appliance. Make sure that when you're doing your inspections, every appliance has a, uh, has a protection of a drip leg. That's very important during your inspection. We are not required to test for gas leaks. You certainly can if you'd like to go beyond the standards. You could use something like soap and water. You could use a detector if you'd like. But our standards do not require us to look for gas leaks. We should, though, look for drip legs as we go into the appliance. Heating and ventilation. When we're inspecting heating and ventilation per the ComSOP, first thing we need to note is, is there a permanent means of access to the appliance if it is greater than 16 feet off the ground. So that means you do, you're not required to bring a ladder, especially a 20, 30, 40, 50 foot ladder to get up onto the roof. So if we do not have a permanent means of access on any roof greater than 16 foot, you should note that and be, and be prepared to discuss that in your report. Also, if the appliance is placed on a roof with a greater slope than 25%, then there should be a flat working platform in front of that appliance at, so that we have the ability to stand safely and not stand on a sloped surface. Those are really two key safety elements for you as you do your inspection. In this particular case, we are up on a large flat roof. And so we're, we're perfectly fine to move around this appliance and do what we need to do. And so that, that's fantastic. The next thing we need to note is, is there a convenience outlet or receptacle to be able to service these appliances? In this particular roof, we do not have one. I have a service disconnect switch here for which I can shut the power off, but I do not have a convenience outlet. That would be something that I want to discuss with my clients. As far as the rest of the HVAC, we are to inspect, I'm sorry, heating and ventilation. Uh, we'll talk about cooling as we go through here. But on the heating and ventilation side, we are to operate this during normal operating controls only. We do not bypass electronic controls. We do not, we do not turn on systems that are in an off position. We are to inspect the system as it sits. Within the standard on, on, on HVAC, we don't have to dismantle it as well. Any dismantling that you do would be, would be above and beyond the scope of, of the inspection. As we move through heating and ventilation, we can now start looking at the individual units that you're going to inspect. This is called a packaged unit. Other people call it a rooftop unit because we're on the roof, but they call it a packaged unit. It's a packaged unit because this particular unit within the same cabinet houses the heating as well as the cooling. 
and it's, it's assembled or packaged together so that it goes through one central duct line into the distribution source that it needs. Some buildings could have one, two, 22, 52 units up on the roof. The inspection of these is exactly the same. As you inspect these, you will do it all exactly the same way. Um, we'll walk through some of the pieces of, of this assembly. First and foremost, we have a label plate. This particular label plate will have the manufacturer, the model number, and the serial number. When we look at the label plate, it's written in a very similar manner to label plates that you might have seen in residential. This is a Linux unit. Serial number is 5619, so we know this is a 2019 model year. And within that, it'll tell us when you read through here what the BTUs are, 200,000 BTUs. And we can come down here and we'll actually know the size of the, of the air conditioner as well. So it's very important to identify the label plate. That'll help you with the age as well as the size. Uh, your clients are going to want to know that for uh, purposes of, of their future expectations or current expectations. They also want to know how old it is for, for, uh, for knowing its life cycle. We're not required to talk about life cycle. We're not required to comment on life cycle. But I think just being able to tell the client exactly how old it is is certainly enough for them to make intelligent decisions. As we move through here, I'm going to move from this side to this side. First, on this particular unit, we have a very nice built-in service disconnect switch. This particular switch here allows you as the inspector to have control of the appliance. That's fantastic. Because this is a contained unit, we do have a filter box. The filter box is located right here. As the air flows up from the cold air return side of the unit, it passes past the filter box, passes past the blower, and then it goes into the heating box. So right here is the heat exchanger, the burner cells, etc and it blows past here. If we weren't running the heating and we're only running cooling, then it passes past that into the evaporative and condensing coils, which are located in this assembly here. So like I say, a packaged unit is just that. It packages the heating and the cooling into one assembly. These things are great on commercial buildings because they can be dropped in and, and pretty easy. They're pretty easy to maintain. But in the same context on a commercial building, they can be a little bit more problematic because somebody has to come up here to change the filters. So we often find these filters to be very, very dirty. In a moment, we'll take this cover off. We'll take a look at the filter. Sometimes we might not have filters here. Sometimes the filter is located down in the, uh, in the other space and it's up in the ceiling. So, so you can find the filter both in here or down in the cold air return side. And so as we move around, one important thing that we must note and must have on all packaged units is the condensate has to have a trap. In this particular case, this is our condensate drain. We see we have a trap and then it's spilling out across the roof deck going over to the roof drain. The, the trap is very important because if we had a straight pipe, if this trap was broken, the potential of air and contaminating air going in through the duct system is uh, very high. And especially if we had a plumbing vent in great proximity. It's very important to note that we shouldn't have any plumbing vents or any waste vents or any type of ventilation that is exhausting from the building within 10 foot of this appliance uh, because we do not want to cross that air. I'm going to move around to this side and I want to show you another part of this system. We have two more filters on this. Um, each has a different purpose. We have an economizer filter on the bottom here, and that's, uh, that opens and closes as the unit wants more fresh air. We have a constant inlet here that's always bringing fresh air into the unit, but the unit on the bottom, which is a hinged unit, opens and closes. What that does is that helps the building always maintain fresh fresh air and not recycling stale office air on a continual basis. And so this would be the economizer. This is the fresh air intake. Sometimes they're the combination of both. Uh, on this particular Lennox's, they do put both of them on, but sometimes you might just see one and sometimes you might see none. Uh, the economizer is an option that they can, they can decide to do as well as fresh air intake they can decide to do. One of the concerns we're going to have 
because we need to make sure there are no vents or any systems off-gassing through the building within 10 foot of the appliance. And so I have an appliance here. This is really close to 10 foot, but if you take a look, the reason why this has been placed four foot above the roof line versus down low, which you typically find them, is so it's gassing up here in the atmosphere and not down low where it's gonna be drawn into the appliance. Watch for that, that's very important. You'll see everything. You'll go up on roofs and you'll see uh, empty paint bottles and everything else packed, stacked up behind these units because the boss never comes up here. And so you, you know, you'll be surprised what you're gonna find up on the roof. So make sure you take and be very conscious of what could be stored and what is offing on the roof. Other things to consider when you're thinking about air intake would be any other ventilation equipment that could be being off and drug into. It could be air off, air intakes or X, X, X fills from loading docks. It could be exhaust from bathrooms. It could, be, it could be any type of exhaust we have. It could be the exhaust from the top of a kitchen vent. All of these could be taking air and drawing it into the HVAC unit. So any unit that sucks air in to an HVAC unit has to have at least a 10 foot gap between any other appliance. Make sure you look for that. During your inspection, it's very important that you operate all of the systems in the building using their normal controls. You need to describe their energy sources as well as the methods of heating. In this building, we have rooftop package units, mini split units, as well as electric baseboard heating. We, the rooftop unit is, is supplied by gas and electricity. The mini split is electric only, and the electric baseboard is electric only. It is important to identify those in every inspection you perform. After you've come down off the roof and you start moving through the rest of your inspection, you're gonna start tracing the ductwork that comes off of the packaged unit. The ductwork on the, uh, on the packaged unit can be in many different configurations. The most common configuration is the supply side and the return side. On the return side in this building, we have the inlet pipe here. Very common to find that inlet pipe to be open or ducted. The ducted one would have complete duct system off of the return side and that would go into return ducts throughout the entire space that it supplies air to or it could be an open plenum like we have here, which is for this warehouse space. There are also open plenums that are present above ceiling tiles where they'll just have open vents and they use that ceiling tile space as the return duct. That we call an open return system. And that's what we have here. Within the duct system, we'll have on the supply side all of the various distributions. In this particular case, we've got a T supply, which means half of the air goes to one side and half of the air goes to the other side, and then we're branching off of that with zoning. If you could imagine on some systems off of that side, we where we have just a normal vent, we could have a complete duct come off of that, supplying whichever office space or room that is desired. And so it's very important when you look at the ductwork that it needs to be sealed, complete, and secured. Not open, not have breaches, not, not look like a sieve or a colander in which we're trying to blow air through. And so, and so when we look at the ductwork, you just wanna trace it as far as you can, where you can, and where is visible. That's why it's so important when you're doing the ductwork inspection that you look up into the suspended ceiling even though the suspended ceiling movement of the tiles is beyond the scope, the only way you're gonna see this is to be up there. So make sure during your inspection, you take every effort to take a look at the ductwork where it's visible. So if we're done with the rooftop portion of the RTU unit or packaged unit, then the next element of the inspection would be to operate it. Again, if I was working in tandem with a teammate, then I could be up on the roof, they could be down here exercising the thermostats, and I would be there while they were doing it. I could come down here, exercise the thermostat, run back up on the roof, watch it in that operation, run back down here, turn it to the other operation, run back up on the roof, 
That's a lot of work and that's a lot of effort. Certainly can do that. There's a lot of different ways in which you can operate your practice. Again, we do not have to turn the unit, take any elements of the unit off, but we should note if it's working or not working. That can be done right here. The thermostat was set at 78. I've turned it down to 66 in the cooling, and so I would use just a normal infrared thermographer. Th I would use just a normal infrared thermometer, and I would test the cooling temperature coming out of the system. And that's what I would do, is I'd test the, the supply, I would test the return, make sure that I'm pushing the proper delta or change across the system for which you operate your business. Everybody has a little different change in temperature. Some are 20, 14 to 22, so, some are 12 to 20 uh, degrees of change. Everybody operates different. You'll make sure you let your clients know which you do and then you'll test the system. Once you've taken the temperature reading, I've got 64 degrees coming out of the supply. I have got 78 coming out of the return. That's 14 degrees. And so at 14 degrees, the system is properly working. So then I would move on, test the next system or the next unit. And if I got 20, I will repeat this 20 times. And then I can also come over, I can take the thermostat, I can change it from heat to cool, I mean, sorry, from cool to heat, take the thermostat up and operate it as well. And so it's very important to test all of those units throughout the entire building, and then you'll know accurately if the rooftop package unit functions. Another consideration is to always look at building manipulation. Many times units, any heating and ventilating appliance can be added subsequent to the construction of the building or maybe even during the building. And a lot of times structural members are cut, notched, spliced, or damaged. It's very important during your heating and ventilating inspection to verify that no structural members have been cut, notched, damaged, or spliced. There are some other items to consider that might not be present in every inspection that you do that are certainly part of the CONSOP. And those include determining if there's any ignition sources of any appliances that are located in sleeping rooms, that are located in storage closets, or that are located in surgical rooms. We should not have any ignition sources in any of those, especially rooms that do not have proper combustion clearances. Again, with the standards of practice, we don't have to calculate the amount of combustion, but you should know if there is enough by, by the basic standards that apply to inspections. We should also make sure that uh, we don't have any exhaust discharging into public spaces and that could create fire hazards, public nuisances, introduce smoke, grease, or other vapors or odors into a public space. We need to make sure we, we don't have that. And we also need to look at the likelihood of excessive heat odors, fumes, sprays, gases, noxious gases, or smokes, or smoke that might go to any space. So just kind of being aware to the installation, the building could have been built in, in, in an X amount of period, and then sometime in, in, in future years, somebody's come in and done some manipulation, and so the building could have changed and things can happen. Then we also need to, to note any past, present, or, or active drainage that might cause mold or other issues. So these are there's certainly things that we need to look at. Follow the COMSOP as close as possible per the building that you're inspecting. We know not every building is exactly the same, but the standards are there to encompass all the buildings. Refer to the COMSOP when at all possible.